Hi, my name is Preetham Raj. I'm a board certified internist, psychiatrist, and uh, also have a certification in, in uh, psychosomatic medicine. I am uh, a clinician educator at Oregon Health and Science University, where I serve as the medical director of the internal medicine practice. Memory disorders are a uh, common complaint. So patient comes in complaining of uh, difficulty um, with recent memory and thoughts start to drift to a differential diagnosis of, of whether this is prodromal Alzheimer's dementia, whether this is um, uh, an iatrogenic complication of medication therapy. Um, so the differential gets very broad very quickly, but we want to have a systematic way of uh, assessing for cognitive changes in our patients. And so I'm a big fan of rating scales, and I teach all of my residents at OHSU uh, the importance of rating scales, whether it be for depression, anxiety, um, and certainly for cognition. Uh, and we uh, tend to use a lot of scales such as the slums or the MOCA or the uh, Folstein uh, mini mental state exam to get a snapshot of, of cognition. And so um, once we've done that and established that say there is a, uh, a def deficit in, in memory per se, or perhaps there is an executive functioning deficit that we've noticed and a patient has strong cerebrovascular or uh, coronary uh, atherosclerotic problems uh, on their problem list, then we start to kind of hone down on, on whether we're looking at vascular risk factors or uh, pro prodromal uh, Alzheimer's type picture uh, or, or other cognitive impairment kinds of issues. Then once we've established that there is a problem, then we, we start to look at, well, um, what is the exact etiology, and then that's where you know infections are often a culprit in older patients who may have a touch of delirium, or even delirium superimposed on early cognitive problems. We call that beclouded uh, dementia. If there are no real identifiable problems, then we also want to entertain pseudo dementia, right? Pseudo dementia is where mood states or anxiety states can mimic cognitive changes and we want to look at that and make sure we've screened for that. And then I often get asked, well then, okay, we've diagnosed mild cognitive impairment, we've diagnosed maybe some delirium, what do we do next? So the treatment phase is really, it boils down to what I spend 80% of my time, I think, as an internist doing, which is, gets back to diet, uh, diet optimization, activity level modification, notice I didn't say exercise, but activity level modification, and then other, other kinds of things which pharmacotherapy can be part of. So I was uh, an active researcher in the Cache County Memory Study that was uh, based in Utah, and it was a multi-academic uh, multi, uh, center-based study. And what we, um, what we found in that was, in some cases, in observational data, some nutrition and nutrients were impactful in preserving cognition. So in, I'm thinking of one particular example where one of our observational studies showed that the combination of vitamin E and C together was very helpful, and you think about the antioxidant properties, etc., um, that uh, were helpful in slowing down the progression of, of, uh, of early mild cognitive impairment, um, the prodrome to Alzheimer's. Then it gets to activity level. Is the patient active? There is abundance of data where activity level correlates with health in general, and certainly in, in cognitive protection. Um, and, and even uh, there was a nice article talking about the speed of gait, uh, of, of how fast somebody walks is even a predictor of how they will do in, at five and 10 year intervals, especially as we get older. So I focus on getting my activity level and I talk about wearing a pedometer. I've done that myself at, at our home institution. We're big on, on focusing on, uh, on activity level and that's just walking. Uh, patients don't like to sometimes hear the word exercise because they often think about, well, I have to go to a gym or get expensive equipment, but we're talking about simple walking and walking quickly um, to the tune of about 1.5 miles per day is the recommended uh, uh, amount of activity level. Um, so not really focusing on maximal heart rates or anything like that. I just want my patients, especially with early cognitive changes, to walk about a mile and a half, um, at a, at a re relatively easy pace, which would be about a 20-minute mile. That, that's the kind of thing. And uh, wearing a pedometer helps to sometimes ra raise awareness on that. And then a lot of controversy on things like brain teasers. I clinically have seen a lot of benefit, and some experts in the field have actually reported that 
there may be merits that were not really fully studied in that Nature article, uh, which seemed to discount the benefits of brain teasers. But you know that I still think that there is there is some merit to uh, advising our patients to exercise their brain, if you will. And then we get to pharmacotherapy if it's in an early, um, mild, moderate Alzheimer's uh, dementia state. Uh, that's when we talk about cholinesterase inhibitors. They have not been you know, the panacea that we were hoping for uh, on those fronts, but it is a, a treatment option. Again, if we uh, are practicing shared decision making, that's probably one thing we want to talk about. And as things progress to moderate to severe um, Alzheimer's dementia, then uh, Namenda or Mamantine in combination uh, with uh, cholinesterase inhibitors is probably the most uh, compelling data, but there is some um, monotherapy data there as well for, for that. But again, drugs right now, not, not as uh, important as, I think, lifestyle modification. 